I noticed in this evening's uh, prayer request that there were a number of prayer requests for physical needs, uh, people that were ill. I also noticed that there were several requests to pray for the salvation of individuals. And if you take a moment and think about it, there's probably nothing more powerful than praying for something that is in the will of God. And it is in the will of God that people would come to know Him through Jesus Christ. And so these requests for the salvation of these individuals is a very powerful prayer. And so we lift those people up this evening. Before I begin to pray, let me uh, draw your attention to Psalm 19, which will kind of help us along in our study this evening. Let me read verse 1. The heavens are telling of the glory of God, and their expanse is declaring the work of His hands. Day to day pours forth speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. Verse 14. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Let us all pray. Lord, do we see your handiwork around us today? Uh, do we take the time to take note and then thank you for your handiwork? Whether it's the mountains or the sunrises, the sunsets, the ocean, the stars above at night, um, how majestic is your name and, and, Father, also your creation. Father, this evening we come and we lift these names, these circumstances and situations up to you. We bring them to you with great faith that you will answer them in some way, shape, or form. And may we praise you for the answers that you will be bringing us in the future. For it's in Christ's name we pray, amen. Well, good evening. Uh, for those of you that uh, weren't here for the first couple sessions, I'm Philip Lilly. I go by Phil, and uh, we're already into uh, part three of our series, The Story of Christianity, which in effect is... Uh, the history of the church and all of those that have gone before us. Now, before we really get started, I think everyone had some homework to do. So uh, if you've made yourself some notes, uh, we're going to turn to the, uh, the book of Acts. And uh, let me go ahead and... Okay, we're going up to slide 18 here in just a second. This is a quick review, by the way, so take notes. Okay, Story of Christianity, Part 3. Okay, uh, that was your assignment, uh, to read Acts 28, verses 1 through 31. That shouldn't probably take you uh, much, much time to do that. And uh, here we go. Here's the question. Last week's homework, um, answer some questions. Uh, what did Paul do while he was in confinement? Uh, we know in uh, Acts, and if you're... Let me turn real quick here to the uh, end of Acts, and in Acts 28, okay, in uh, Acts 28, uh, when uh, they had been uh, brought safely through, then they found out that they was on the island of Malta, and then they moved forward in verse 16, and then we entered Rome, Paul, as we entered Rome, Paul was allowed to stay by himself with a soldier who was guarding him, and then we kind of jump forward to verse 25, and when they did not agree with one another, he was talking with some Jews, they began leaving after Paul had spoken one parting word, and that was, the Holy Spirit rightly spoke through Isaiah the prophet to your fathers, and then he quotes that, and uh, then down in 30 and 31, and he stayed two full years in his own rented quarters. He was renting quarters, no doubt. Uh, and he was welcoming all who came to him. He could have friends and people that he would greet, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching concerning the Lord uh, Jesus Christ with all openness and unhindered. 
being unhindered. Um, so while Paul was uh, in these quarters, kind of under house arrest, he really wasn't in a prison, uh, what do we know or what do we think he was doing at that time? Writing. He was doing a lot of writing. He was writing uh, epistles. He was writing letters to specific churches. He was also writing letters to groups of ch churches. Uh, when they would write a letter that would be circulated around through what we call Asia Minor, those were called encyclical letters, encyclical letters. Uh, to be shared with other churches. So there were some letters that went directly to a church to address an issue, a problem, or a challenge, but then there were other letters that were, you can almost tell they're kind of generic. They don't talk about, say hello to my buddies in, and he would name the town. It was just a general letter that he would circulate. What else did he do while he was there? He witnessed to the Jews, he witnessed to the, to the centurions that were guarding him, anybody that he could come in contact with, he would talk to them. Have you ever met somebody like that? <laughs> sure you have. Yeah, they just, and, and there were several prayer requests that I noted where people said, and, and bring opportunities for me to witness, and, and maybe, may I be humble when I'm witnessing for the Lord Jesus Christ. And may God get all the glory. That was Paul. He was a humble man that just wanted to share the gospel. Now, here's the, the bonus round question. Uh, what does Scripture tell us what ultimately happened to Paul? Does Scripture tell us what happened to Paul? It doesn't. It just kind of <laughs> drops off and it's kind of like, well, where's the rest of the story? Or How many of you remember Paul Harvey? Raise your hand, yeah. And what did he always say? The and the rest of the story. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what are some of the traditions that you've heard about Paul? What finally happened to him? What are some of the traditions? He was beheaded. He was beheaded. Any others that you're thinking of? And where did that happen, that the legend says? In Rome. Yeah, that uh, tradition tells us that uh, he was beheaded in Rome, no different than many of the other apostles at that time, and probably some disciples, and probably as we moved into the period of Nero, which we're talking about right now while he's in Rome, okay, many were beheaded. Uh, many of them were burned at the stake. Many of them, as we talked about last week, had other gruesome, you know, deaths that they were facing. So, yeah, now, something that we're going to be talking about, not only tonight, but in the weeks ahead, is legends, traditions. Now, we know what the Bible says, and it ends at the end of Acts, and he stayed there two years, and he was sharing the gospel, and that's it. So, I'm going to try to be as clear as I can when we talk about any of the apostles or any of the subsequent folks that shared the gospel, church leaders, whether what we know about them is biblical or if it's legend, if it's legend. And, and that, that doesn't change the gospel message about Jesus Christ, but what it does, it helps us clarify how we get information, how we get information. On down the road, we'll be talking about some of the items, some of the writings that came out of that intertestamental period between the Old Testament and the New Testament, that 400-year period, much we know about or what we believe as Christians about hell, the devil, and other things like that actually came out of non-canonical writings during the intertestamental period and after that. Anybody ever read Dante's Inferno? Okay, well, <laughs> that's just one even post-biblical example. One of the best uh, writers concerning Paul uh, is a gentleman named F.F. Um, F. Bruce. He this is one of his books, uh, uh, books that he wrote, Apostle of, of the Heart Set Free. Uh, he's no longer with us. He passed away in 1990. Uh, he was actually English. Uh, but this has some really great information about speculation and legend about Paul. And there's really two camps 
what happened to Paul. There's one that says he was beheaded in Rome under Nero's authority, taken to court, and uh, he was uh, beheaded. Uh, Another theory is that he was released, wandered around Asia Minor, proselytizing people, and then was rearrested and then beheaded. And there's actually a third theory that he was let go and he made it to Spain. If you think about Paul, throughout his writings, he always says, and on my way to Spain, España, I'll stop and see you folks in Rome. Several times he mentions that. So, you know, we, we can speculate uh, about that just a little bit. Well, let's go ahead and uh, move on to uh, our uh, lesson this evening. Uh, we're looking at what's called the apostolic era. Now, one of the things that we're going to be doing throughout this course is, last week, if you remember, we were looking at the year 33 to about 100, and we were looking at just the initial establishment of the church from the coming of the Holy Spirit and the things that happened immediately after that and some of the martyrdoms that were happening. We're going to kind of overlay that in a parallel fashion, and we're going to be looking at what's called the apostolic era. Next week, we will be looking at what's called the post-apostolic era. Both of them are very, very important in the establishment, continuation, and growth of the church. Now, as we look at these individuals up here, and let me get my pointer going on. Okay, whoops, now how'd that happen? All right, we'll go back. All right, Uh, the apostolic era, uh, 33 to 95 A.D. Uh, 95 A.D. is there uh, because that's about the time we know that John completed his writings, probably on the island of Patmos, okay? And, And once again, legend says that John wound up in Ephesus. That's what legend says, and we'll talk about where these legends come from. So, Uh, Here are the 12, and uh, I know several times in the past uh, in Bible study classes that I've taught, uh, without any notification, I say, here's a blank sheet of paper now, name all 12 of the disciples. And and how many do you think people get on average? Three, four, five at at the most. And and part of that is, as we look at some of the folks that are up here, uh, as as we look at people like uh, Peter... Uh, John, uh, as we look at uh, Matthew over here, um, those are people that we know of them because we have texts uh, and letters uh, that they wrote. But some of the others seem to have kind of uh, disappeared uh, into history. Uh, Two individuals that are often confused uh, are uh, uh, James the Major and James uh, the Minor. Uh, they, they aren't related in any way, and that doesn't mean that he was bigger than he was. Uh, it's just a matter that they say that he was older than James uh, the Minor. Uh, it was, uh, I believe, uh, James the Minor, or depending on your translation, he was called the lesser or the younger. Uh, some people speculate that he was actually the half-brother of Jesus, Now, I ask you the question, why would he be the half-brother of Jesus? Exactly, exactly. Uh, Jesus was born by the Holy Spirit and this by the real Father. Okay. Uh, Another thing that has come up in uh, recent years is uh, as they look at uh, some of Michelangelo's paintings, uh, (laughs) some people say, oh, that was actually Mary in there. Well, no, that's, uh, that's John, okay? So uh, there we have uh, that. I guess it's the long hair that kind of gets him. Uh, if we were really going to portray uh, the Last Supper, this is probably uh, more what it would look like. 
um, um, if, if you've ever traveled over in the, the Middle East, uh, and I've had several opportunities to be over there, you, you just lay down on the carpet, you lean over on your elbow, or you get a pillow or something like that, and, and that's it, and there might be a low table. And so this is probably a better depiction uh, of the Last Supper, or maybe just some meetings that Jesus would have with the, uh, the people, his uh, uh, disciples about to be apostles. And understand that that word apostle comes from the koine or common Greek word apostolos, apostolos, which means messenger. In this case, a messenger with the gospel. And let me stop right there because words are so important. When we use the word gospel, that word actually is translated back into early German, gut spielen. Anybody in here speak German besides me? Gut spielen. Uh, and gut spielen is a, a good story, okay? And, 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 of course, it was transliterated over the uh, years into gospel, gospel. Um, and certainly the gospel is the good news, the good story. So there we have uh, that little little piece. All right. Uh, look down at your handout, if you will, uh, and we're first going to look at uh, Simon Peter. But before I go to Simon Peter, can anybody tell me who the disciple was that replaced Judas? Say again. Okay. Uh, it, 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 yeah, uh, Math, Math, Mathos uh, is the uh, individual, Matthias uh, was the individual that replaced uh, Judas, but from there we jump into Simon Peter, uh, who was the rock. Um, I've put some notes down on your handout there. Uh, when we look at, if you have your Bibles, turn back to uh, Acts 2. Uh, let's see, Acts 2, verse 14. And uh, this is where we kind of pick up and see. Uh, but Peter, uh, taking his stand with the eleven, raised his voice and declared to them, Men of Judea, and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let it be known to you and give heed to my words. And so right away, here's Peter uh, preaching. Uh, and once again, uh, whatever happened to Peter? Well, uh, the legend, the legend is, is that he was crucified, how? Upside down. Uh, is there anything biblically that we know that presses that point? No, there, there, there's nothing. We know that he was uh, in uh, Rome at the time, uh, about the time of Nero, and uh, some of the traditions also have him preaching in Great, what we know as Great Britain today and, and throughout other pieces of uh, uh, Europe, uh, but he was very active in terms of evangelizing and preaching. Now, I, I go back to the, the point about legend. How is it that we know what we know vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, legend? And uh, there were actually some early writers, uh, one of who, whom was... Uh, a guy named Eusebius, Eusebius, okay? This is in your bibliography, so you can, if you want to, you can purchase it online. Uh, Eusebius wrote what was called uh, Ecclesiastical History. Now, if you remember from two weeks ago, we talked about where did the word church come from? Uh, and it comes from the uh, Greek word ecclesia, Ecclesia, and then that kind of was like translated into uh, the, the, you know, other languages and became Kirche in, in German, okay, and that eventually Kircha in Old English and then became church, okay? And so really what this is is Eusebius church history is what it was. Now, Eusebius was alive around 300 A.D., Okay, now he's talking about people that were living about 100 A.D. Does anybody know anybody here personally from 200 years ago? 
No, but, but you, you have probably talked to some of your relatives that knew somebody, okay? When my older brother did the gene- genealogy of our family, uh, which uh, the Lilly family came to the United States in 1642, okay? And he kind of went back a couple generations, found photographs, went to courthouses, talked to some people, uh, did interviews, things like that, and put, kind of put it together, you know, going back 300 years. That's pretty good. I bet you that's how he did it, too. He talked to a lot of people, did a lot of research, knew somebody that knew somebody that was in the church and said, what do you know about? Well, so-and-so who mentored me told me that, okay? And so that's where we get much of the information about uh, uh, Peter, the rock. And uh, if, uh, if you'll recall, there are some passages uh, in the Bible uh, that talk about uh, Peter, and uh, they talk very clearly about uh, how he, uh, Jesus, was going to establish his church on Peter. Now, we, as, as part of the, the Protestant family and Baptists, we do not believe that the church was established on Peter, but it was on Peter's faith, and we are a faith religion is what we are. Uh, and I mentioned last week that if we would go over to our Roman Catholic friends, they would say that Jesus established the church on Peter, and in their theology, their church theology, Peter becomes the first pope in the church. We do not, we do not adhere uh, to that position. Okay, uh, let's move on to St. Andrew. Uh, and uh, St. Andrew was well known because he uh, spent some time in Sekthia. Sekthia. Uh, he spent time in uh, the Middle East uh, by legend. Once again, this is what we hear uh, through not only uh, Eusebius, but some other writers, uh, early Christian writers. Uh, he spent time in there. And uh, you'll notice that he was crucified by legend on this special cross. Can anybody tell me what kind of cross that is? That's called the St. Andrew's cross. And you'll see that often uh, in different churches and in writings, or uh, if if you go into a religious store, you may see what's called a uh, St. Andrew's uh, cross. Now, uh, legend has it uh, that he eventually... uh, found himself in Greece, spreading the gospel, and uh, while in Greece, he spent a lot of time in uh, what's called Patras. Uh, Now, right there, that part of Greece uh, is called Acacia, and and we read about it in Scripture. Now, right about, let's see if I can hit this right here, Patras is right there, uh, right on the Patras Gulf. And uh, once again, the legend is that St. Andrew was crucified there. Now, the, and of course, this is a depiction by an artist some years later. But do you notice anything odd about that picture? He looks like he's wearing Fruit of the Loom underwear. You know, I mean, they had, <laughs> you know, the, the cloth that they just kind of wrapped, the loincloths that they wrapped around themselves, but that's the only gripe I have with that particular uh, depiction. Uh, so we move ahead, and some of the area that uh, he actually uh, worked was up in here, which is Sekthia, up in here, uh, and then he found his way uh, all the way over to, uh, back over to Greece, over, over in this arena, over here. Uh, I, I hesitated in using this map, except that it kind of shows uh, the big picture of the Mediterranean and so on and so forth. And, and let me just kind of uh, go down a rabbit hole here uh, for a second, if you will, historically and in the Bible, because in two weeks we're going to be start talking about the history and development of the Old Testament and the New Testament. So what I'm going to do here and kind of going way back uh, is talk about the big picture of history. In the Bible, what is probably the first large country or empire that shows up in the Bible? 
Egypt. Okay, Egypt shows up. And then after Egypt, uh, we know that uh, the Hebrews, or as the Persians called them, the Eboos, okay, uh, they were a major power. Uh, and then we have Assyria comes down from the north, okay, up in here. They come down and invade. And then after that, you remember what major power invaded the rest of the world after Assyria? Babylonia, okay, Babylonia comes in. And then after uh, Babylonia, we have Persia, right? Okay, Persia coming down here. Uh, and then uh, the Media uh, Empire, the Medes and the Persians gathered together, and there was what was called the Medo-Persian Empire. And then after them comes the Greeks, okay? And what's so important about the Greeks and what we're discussing over the next weeks to come is that the Greeks developed various types of communications, road, trading, uh, the world economic language of Greek, okay? And then after the Greeks came the, the Romans, the Romans. And, you know, we, I think we give too much credit to the Romans for setting the stage for Jesus Christ. I think it was God working through the Greek, the Hellenistic period that actually developed the infrastructure so that the spread of the gospel was made easier. Can you, can you see how God was working in all of that? Yeah, ab absolutely. Okay. Well, okay. Oh, we almost jumped over Matthew there. Uh, turn on your uh, uh, handout to uh, Matthew, okay? Uh, and we all know that Matthew was the tax collector. He was the, the guy that was collecting uh, taxes uh, for the Roman Empire. And one of the interesting things early on about the Roman Empire, which kind of transitioned into the church in the West or the church in Rome or what we call the Roman Catholic Church today, is they wanted their money. They wanted their money. And, and if you paid your money, you could pretty much worship any God and do anything you want. Uh, we see that transition into the New Testament era to a point to a point with, with Christians, but uh, uh, today in the church in the West, the Roman Catholic Church, uh, you would be really surprised at the diversity within the Roman Catholic Church as far as worship styles, uh, speaking in tongues. Uh, there are a lot of things that go on in a lot of dioceses that you would think, oh, that doesn't sound like the Roman Catholic Church, but as long as they pay their <laughs> their money, as long as the money, you know, goes to Rome, you know, okay, we're, we're good with that. We're good with that. But uh, uh, Matthew was an individual that uh, certainly spent a lot of time uh, in Parthia, which is, see, way over on your uh, right over there, and, and throughout the whole Mediterranean area. He seems to have uh, covered a lot of area, even down to, and, and you've heard the term Cush in your, in your Bibles, uh, Cush, and Cush is probably actually down here. Uh, if we were talking about Cush today, it would be Ethiopia. The Ethiopian area would be what we would call, uh, call Cush. And uh, he also spent time in uh, northern Greece. Uh, so uh, uh, he was quite prolific in sharing the gospel at that particular time. All right, let's move on to... Thomas, okay, uh, the twin or the, the, the doubter. And we all know the stories about how uh, uh, Thomas said, you know, least I, you know, I see him and I put my fingers in his, in his wounds, I won't believe that he's actually alive and that he's been uh, resurrected. Uh, anybody have any idea who his twin brother was? Any legends that you've heard? Well, there are no legends, uh, and he didn't have a twin brother. If you go back to his original name as it was given in a Semitic language, Tatim, okay, it, that kind of morphed into Thomas, and they just kind of, I think, uh, gave him a uh, nickname, 
That was kind of his nickname, uh, the twin. Uh, but we do not know that he had any particular uh, brother, uh, a twin brother. Now, one of the legends that we have heard over the years is that he wound up in Lampore, India. Okay? And, and we do know that early on in the, uh, the legacy of Christianity, that there were some large groups of Christians in India which is pretty amazing when you think about uh, the amount of travel that you would need to do to uh, uh, go to uh, India. And uh, legend also tells us that uh, he lived until he was about 72, until he was about 72 years old. Now, we talked about uh, uh, where legend comes from. One, one source is uh, Eusebius. Uh, another source is uh, an individual named Josephus. Uh, Josephus, and I th- may have put that down on your uh, handout there. Uh, Josephus lived between 37 to probably about 100 A.D., so he was right in the middle of things. Now he was not a, he was not a Christian, okay? He was kind of a secular writer, um, and a, a lot of um, post um, post epic uh, Christian writers uh, have often debated whether he was. Um, more of an insider Roman, or, or whether he was kind of a, a closet Christian. They really didn't know, but they do know, and uh, you know, here's, uh, here's like 600 pages that he wrote in small print about the times and the people. And he mentions many of the Christians uh, that we're talking about this evening, and I think that is also in your, uh, your bibliography, so you can take a look at that maybe uh, online. Uh, Okay, uh, one individual that we know a lot about is uh, John, uh, and of course we know that uh, he wrote the uh, book of Revelation, uh, Apocalyptos, uh, the unveiling of, of Christ in, in the future. Uh, we know that he was on the uh, island of uh, uh, Patmos, uh, never been there. Uh, when uh, one of the, the positions I had in the government was we were training uh, foreign governments in anti-terrorism methods. And uh, I was, uh, Carol and I were out in Oklahoma City, uh, which was probably the last place in the world that Carol ever wanted to be. People in Oklahoma are really nice. It's just flat. Oklahoma is so flat you can watch your dog run away for three days. <laughs> but all that being said, uh, one of the groups that we had come into uh, our training center uh, was a Greek anti-terrorism police group, and uh, got to know them. They were usually there for like six, uh, six to eight weeks, so we would have some of these folks over at our house and got to know them. Uh, most, of the, most of them spoke really good English, and uh, one of the shameful things that I never got to cash in on was one of their leaders said, Mr. Lilly, if you ever get over to Greece, we'll give you a free tour of Patmos. I went like, oh, you're on for that, but just never never materialized. And of course, uh, we do know that legend tells us that uh, uh, he eventually left and uh, died in Ephesus somewhere around the year 100, somewhere around the year uh, about uh, uh, 100. And, uh, and of course, uh, we are blessed by many of his uh, uh, writings that he has made. Now, Here's the important uh, feature that comes out uh, about these individuals, and certainly we didn't cover all of them. Um, What legacy did they leave Christianity? What legacy did they leave us today? Uh, We know that that Christ mentored uh, 12 minus 1 plus 1, uh, and those those 12 certainly went out and scattered. Uh, We know about Paul. And all he did, uh, you know, all, all of the, the probably thousands of miles that he traveled in carts, on donkeys, on foot, and so on and so forth. But the question is, what happens from there? Is there a transition from the apostles, the original 12 apostles, to like a next generation? Because he, here we are today. Here we are today. And how did we really get here today uh, post-apostles? Well, uh, what I want to do is uh, uh, talk a little bit about how some of the apostles 
mentored other people, and, and when you are mentored, you're a disciple of this other person. So the apostles had disciples that they worked with that were called to, if I can use the word generously, ministry, and then they moved on uh, into the uh, future. So let's look at them. Uh, the first one that's down on your uh, handout is an individual named uh, Polycarp, Polycarp. And he was alive from about 69 to about 160 A.D. And we know some of this vis-a-vis uh, -vis some of these writers that we've talked about and writers beyond Polycarp and others that, that knew them personally. Uh, one of the interesting things about uh, Polycarp was he eventually became the bishop of Smyrna. Now, let me stop right there and, and say that that word bishop is a very important word because it's going to show up in the development of the New Testament years later. Uh, some of your Bibles use the word bishop. Some of your Bibles use the word overseer. Okay? Now, the original Greek word uh, that is translated uh, from bishop is episkipos. Episkipos. Now, does that strangely sound like a denomination that we know? Yeah, Episcopal. Yeah, Episcopos uh, is literally translated overseer. So all of these early churches had one individual that was kind of called to be the, the Daryl <laughs> of the church, the overseer, the guy that ran the church, okay? But back then, the overseer was probably what we would call the pastor also. Now, that word pastor really doesn't surface until after 1500 in the Reformation, okay? So back then, the person that kind of ran the church, that talked, uh, that did all the administrative stuff was the bishop or the overseer or the episcopos. And uh, when we talk about different forms of church organization, the Episcopal form is one of the main forms of what's called church polity or organization. Uh, and the bishop form of government is used by the Roman Catholic Church, the Orthodox Church, the Episcopal Church, the Methodist Church, where they have like a bishop over several churches or a diocese or, or, or whatever. So uh, that's important for us to realize that he was a, one of the original uh, bishops uh, in the church. Uh, second is a guy named Clement of Rome. Clement of Rome. And uh, Clement was very important because uh, we're told that both he and Polycarp, he and Polycarp, Clement, Clement of Rome and Polycarp were both discipled by the Apostle John. And we know this from subsequent writings. It's kind of like it's, it's there in history that John taught these two guys, mentored these two guys, walked them through what it meant uh, to be a Christian and uh, Scripture and some of the letters that were out there. Understand, too, that at this point in history, we didn't have a New Testament. We just had some scattered letters out there, and some of them were being copied, uh, some of them probably got lost. Uh, others' churches were just holding on to them. It seems like the church in Rome was able to gather probably more of these early letters from the apostles and others than many of the other churches uh, that were out there. But uh, Clement of Rome was very important. Uh, he was considered the bishop of Rome, the overseer of the Christian church in Rome. Uh, now, in, in Greek, in Greek, uh, the word pope is actually translated as father, okay? And so he was looked upon as the father of the church in Rome. And now you can see uh, that that uh, Greek word, papas or papa, okay, was just attached to that bishop in Rome. And then as Rome gathered more influence and more power, he became the sole pope, okay? And that's, that's where that terminology uh, comes from. Okay, moving on. 
Uh, next is a, a gentleman named Ignatius, and he was the bishop or overseer of the Christian church in Antioch. And you notice that uh, we're rapidly going through all of those major Christian centers that you saw on the map in the past two weeks, and we'll review it here in just a second. <clears throat> uh, and so Antioch now was a major Christian church, and Ignatius uh, was the individual that was tapped to become the uh, bishop of that church. Now, one of the interesting things, and I think I put this down in your handout, was that uh, Ignatius wrote about the importance of the incarnation of Jesus. Now, we today, we just say, well, yeah, okay? But in the early church, they didn't understand that theology, that He was the incarnation of God on earth. They probably hadn't cognitively kind of figured out, or well, they were, at this point in history, they weren't even thinking Trinity. They weren't even thinking Trinity. Uh, they just knew that Jesus was God on earth, but really, what, what does that mean? So Ignatius, okay, probably uh, under the influence of the Holy Spirit, was able to uh, articulate and also argue the point uh, that Jesus was the incarnation. Now, at the same time, uh, there was a group in the church, uh, the Christian church, that were called uh, Docetus, uh, Docetus, and, and they believed that, and these were Christians in the early church, they believed that Christ really wasn't a physical body. Now, if somebody said that to you today, you'd say, what? You'd go, What? <laughs> You know, what planet did you drop into in, in this church, okay? Uh, but Ignatius was a guy that says, no, he was flesh and blood on earth. And he was probably one of the first overseers or bishops or uh, uh, post-apostolic individuals that actually said, this, this, is, this is truth, uh, this is correct. And so uh, he was very important. Uh, and he was one of the first individuals to distinguish between bishops and elders. Bishops and elders. He thought those were two distinct positions in the church. Now, if we take the, the position of elder, and typically in churches that I've been in in the past, I considered an elder to be somebody that was like a long-term member and that was very well read and was well respected in the church. That's kind of the way that I referred to uh, elders. But that elder, the word elder actually goes back into early Greek, the Greek Koine language, from the word presbyteros. Oh, now where does that, does that sound like a denomination too? Yeah, Presbyterian. Yeah, and, and uh, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands, but, you know, uh, I've met many former Presbyterians in, in a Baptist church, and uh, when I asked them, well, how did your church run? And they would say, our church was run by elders, right, elders, okay? And, and so uh, here we have Ignatius is saying, well, you know, there's two distinct responsibilities. You know, you do have the bishop or the overseer, okay? And then you've got elders in the church. Now, later on, we'll get into deacons, okay? And, and if you have, uh, how many of you have been in uh, different Baptist churches as you've moved around? Okay. Yeah, a lot of you. Now, if you, if you go to one Baptist church and you see one group of deacons, you've seen one Baptist church and one group of deacons, okay? Almost every Baptist church has a different way of using their deacons, yeah, okay? So, uh, Ignatius, he was very important in terms of uh, making that uh, distinction between those particular uh, positions. And I think I also noted on your handout that he had a great ministry in the area of Syria. Syria. Uh, I think it was last week or the week before when we were uh, talking, uh, I mentioned the city of Aleppo. You remember that? Aleppo? Okay, if you didn't write it down the previous weeks, write it down now, A-L-E-P-P-O, Aleppo. That's kind of in northwest Syria. As we get into the uh, development 
uh, in the history of the Old Testament, that little city is going to pop up uh, predominantly, uh, very auspiciously. Okay, uh, and then the last person I want to talk about is Irenaeus. He's a little bit later in this group, uh, 135 to 202. He was the Bishop of Lyon, uh, which is uh, at this time called Gaul, but we know it as, as France. So he was the overseer of that uh, church there. Uh, he was a staunch defender of heresies. Now, one of the things that we're finding here is because uh, there was no corpus or body that we call the New Testament. We had the Old Testament, okay? And, and what, do, what do Jews call the, what we call the Old Testament? What do they call that? The Tanakh, okay? And we're going to, in a couple of weeks, we're going to talk about the, the Tanakh and its formulation uh, going on in the centuries. Um, but he was a staunch defender of kind of the, the fundamentals of the faith. And I remember probably a couple months ago, uh, Gary preached on the fundamentals of the faith. You know, that, uh, that Scripture is inherent, inerrant, uh, that God is God, that He is the supreme being. You know, He is the creator, the sustainer. Jesus Christ is the Lord and the Savior. He is the propitiatory act, uh, and that the Holy Spirit is what comes to live inside of us and convicts us, comforts us, so on and so forth. Well, <laughs> that's... That's what Irenaeus basically was saying. You know, here's the fundamentals. Now, there were other people that were going off in different directions, hypotheticals, that were in the church, and people were listening to them. And so uh, Irenaeus was saying, time out on the field. Let's get some of this straight, okay? Let's get the facts where they are and see what Jesus actually said. Uh, he also said that the divine goal of my, mankind was to have fellowship with God. Boy, that, that sounds bedrock. That sounds basic to me. That's our primary uh, purpose is to have fellowship with God and live with Him in eternity. Okay, let's move on. The impact of the apostles in John. And, and remember, some of these people like uh, Polycarp and uh, Clement of, of Rome were actually discipled by John, the Apostle John. So there was this direct connection, Jesus to the apostles to this next uh, generation. Okay, bad teachings or heresies. All right, uh, this is kind of, uh, well, actually, I think before we get to that, let me back up just a second. Uh, look down on your hand out there. Um, I must have skipped over this on the slides. Uh, in Roman numeral two, uh, early church apologists, leaders, writers, and heresies. Let me just kind of go down through that. Um, what is an apologist? Uh, an apologist is uh, one who writes or speaks in defense of a faith or belief. Apologeticos, apologeticos is, is that uh, Greek word. And if I can read from this, uh, where do we derive the English word apology? Well, when we think of apology, we think of somebody apologize. Oh, I'm sorry, okay? But the original Greek word apologeticos really means to, to take a position, to make a defense, to say what's truth. And so there are a lot of... Uh, uh, apologists within the Christian church. Uh, now, uh, you, you have to understand that these people did not have modern-day Bibles. They just had some scanty writings, but yet these people, I believe, were under the conviction of the Holy Spirit and were going in the right direction. And that list that we looked at could all be considered uh, apologists. Look down at B on your handout there. Who were the apologists? Uh, there was one guy, uh, I think it's on your handout, Quadratus. He was the bishop, bishop in Athens, Greece, uh, or uh, Macedonia at that time. Another uh, individual, Justin Martyr, uh, who was beheaded uh, because he was stepping out uh, as a Christian. Athenagoras, uh, and he argued for the resurrection of the dead. Well, he was one of the first individuals in the church to argue positively that Christians would be resurrected. 
Now, once again, we as Christians today just take that as, well, yeah, you know, Gary says that, Brian says that, Daryl says that, Phil's saying that tonight. But back then, there was a lot of ambiguity. You know, did, was he resurrected? You know, what, what's that all about? So there wasn't any definitive teaching. And so you have people like him uh, that were actually arguing for it. Athenagoras, okay? I kind of like the ring of that name. Argued for the resurrection of the dead. And then down in C, uh, many of the early writers and leaders taught and traveled to spread the gospel throughout the known world. What do you think uh, these individuals, whether it was Thomas or Matthew or whoever, what do you think some of their challenges were when they were going out? What, what do you think some of their challenges might have been? Uh, eating, <laughs> yeah. Sustenance, yeah. Just having enough to buy some food or somebody to give them food. Because not everybody, I mean, there are a lot of pagans out there. Uh, and, of course, there were probably a lot of people that were uh, teaching all types of, you know, different types of religions. And, oh, yeah, here, here, have a loaf of bread and, you know, move on down the road. Uh, what would some of the other challenges be for an early apologist or a missionary? Transportation. Transportation. <laughs> yeah, that's right. It's not like you could jump on the dog, huh? You know, and, and jump on Greyhound bus and go someplace or rent a car or or, you know, just hitch a ride down the road. Um, no different than, how many people do we have here that have uh, gone down to Honduras uh, on missionary trips? Uh, yeah, that's not exactly a piece of cake. Uh, I, I, I've been to Honduras, but I was in Tegucigalpa. But when I used to go down to Haiti, when you get, you know, out of the main, you know, like Port-au-Prince, I mean, a road, you know, they, they, of course, there were, there were a lot of roads like the Silk Road and the Roman Road and so on and so forth. But beyond that, they were just kind of like uh, uh, stone and mud and, you know, so it was, it was difficult. Yeah, uh, so just uh, supporting themselves, uh, they, they, uh, the crime, uh, there were probably robbers on the road. Uh, so they had a lot of challenges uh, that they needed to deal with. Um, down lastly in D. Uh, what was the role and legacy of these early church leaders, this first generation of leaders and writers uh, that passed away? Well, they, they carried on what Scripture that they had. They, they carried on what Scripture that they knew. Uh, and they carried on the witness of the apostles that went before them. Uh, one of the early, and you can write this down and, and Google it later, later if you want to, was a, uh, an early Christian um, follower, writer, I think, believe he's also a bishop. His name was Tertullian, Tertullian. Uh, now, I, I did, has anybody ever heard of Tertullian other than some, <laughs> of course, Bob has. If you've been in one of my classes, you've heard about Tertullian. Uh, Tertullian was the first early Christian writer, se early second century, that actually articulated the Trinity, and he came up with the word trias, trias, which later was uh, morphed into Trinity, and he articulated fairly clearly after reading different letters, he, he probably said, you know, you know I, I, I think I see this picture, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and in him dwells all the fullness of deity. Uh, go forward in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and I give you the Spirit. Uh, and, if, and if I do not go away, and this is John 16, if I, I do not go away, then the Holy Spirit will not come and convict mankind of sin, righteousness, and judgment. And he probably, you know, he, oh, geez, there's a trinity, okay? Because as, as all of you know, uh, trinity or Trinitarian theology is not a biblical word. But if you merge it all together, and can you see somebody like Tertullian just sitting down and going like, ha-ha, <laughs> look what I found. And there were probably somebody, some people in the church who were saying, you're, you're off your rocker. Okay, uh, we were ready now for bad heresies. Let's, let's get in. <laughs> this is kind of interesting. Uh, the first one down on your list there is Gnosticism. Uh, the word Gnosticism comes from the Greek word gnosis. 
uh, which is knowledge. And, and of course, I think most of us know that Gnosticism was, uh, in so many words, uh, secret knowledge. Uh, so, and I've just been given the, uh, the signal that we're at 7 o'clock, and we haven't gone through the... Uh, tell you what we'll do. Uh, let's end this right now. Draw a line uh, right down there at E. What were some of the bad teachings? Um, Gnosticism. Um, and down there, at the very end, I'll give you a teaser there. Uh, personal uh, secretly revealed uh, spiritual knowledge over orthodox teaching, orthodox meaning original or correct, gnosis, uh, divine knowledge, modern, Joseph Smith and the Mormons. Okay? That's modern day Gnosticism. Okay. Uh, are there any real quick questions before we close? I was kind of jabbering on there and I got the, uh, the hook <laughs> from, from up above. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, <laughs> Chris, thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> I was just kind of on a roll. Uh, any real quick questions? I can stick around afterwards. Yes. There are some indications. There are some indications. And let me take that, and I'll, uh, next week we'll, we'll kind of capsulate. But that, yeah, that's a good, that's a good point. Uh, uh, yeah, bring the kids. Okay, pack up the kids. We're leaving. <laughs> It's not like we're getting getting in the uh, the 26 foot RV and uh, going up to Fall Creek Falls, <laughs> so, something like that. Any other quick questions? I'll stick around afterwards and answer any questions you have. Um, how about a benediction from uh, the New Testament book of Jude? And now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and make you stand in his presence, blameless with great joy, to the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be all majesty, dominion, and authority before all times, now and forevermore. Amen. Have a great week.